Okay guys, I wanted to kind of give you a rundown on how to do lab 14. It tends to be one of the more difficult ones, and especially since it's your first lab to get started, just to give you a little idea of what's expected. Um, as we go through this, I'm going to apologize right now for the mic quality. I forgot one of my um, really good mics to record this today, but I knew I needed to get this up as soon as possible for you guys to start working on this lab. And also, not every lab is going to have a video that explains what you're supposed to do. Some of them are a little more self-explanatory. However, we are going to take a look here in how to create a cladogram. So this is lab 14 um, in your lab book. Um, lab 14 focuses in on evolution and things that actually um, support evolution, like fossils, similar structures, DNA. Well, here we're going to take that information and we're going to utilize it to create a cladogram, a type of family tree, if you want to call it that. So Darwin's the one that kind of talked about this, and he called this whole process descent with modification. As we move across uh, evolution, we see new traits start to come into play. There's some modifications that help an organism become more suited to their environment. So if you look at this, there's some divergence that happens. Groups after the square on this family tree have a new trait. The square represents that a new trait has come into play. Now this does happen with evolution, which is change over time. This makes the life of the organism uh, more suited for their environment and makes it easier for them to survive. Now, it does take a lot of time before any change does happen within an organism. Now, in this case, guys, we're not saying that necessarily the organism changed from like a rabbit to a tiger. Okay, we're just saying that that rabbit has less characteristics than maybe that tiger does. That tiger has something new that makes it different for its environment. So that's how we're going to be looking at these cladograms. Now, when you look at cladistics, cladistics only looks at shared derived characters that are informative with looking at evolutionary relationships. So when you're looking at a characteristic, you have to identify if it's an ancestral characteristic or derived. Now, ancestral means, does that mean everybody in this group has that? That's an ancestral characteristic. Or is it a new characteristic that only some of the organisms have? Okay. Maybe not all of them have that. Well, if it's, that, if it's that case, it's what we consider a derived characteristic. Now, these characteristics can come from a number of categories. They can be, come from morphology, which means their structure, like how the structure actually looks. It could be from a behavior, how they act. It could come from their physiology, how something works, Okay, like how the um, brain actually works, not necessarily its structure, but how it functions, that's physiology. Or they can also look at the DNA sequence. In today's lab, we're going to focus more on the morphology, the structure that is present. So here's an example. When we look at hair coat, hair coat is what we would call a shared characteristic of all mammals. All mammals have a hair coat, okay? But that's derived for just mammals. It's new to them. Whereas lungs is an ancestral trait if you are comparing mammals with amphibians and reptiles because all of them have lungs. However, reptiles and amphibians do not have hair. So that's a new derived characteristic for mammals. So using this information, let's look at your actual lab. So in your lab, it discusses several organisms and it also just talks about some characteristics. Well, let's look at the organisms first. So if we take a look here in, um, the, on this particular slide, I gave you a picture of all these, these organisms. And they're kind of in order as you go across. We can see here you have the kangaroo in the top corner. You did have the lamprey. Okay, the lamprey is one that you probably didn't know about. All right, we have a rhesus monkey, which is here. The bullfrog, a snapping turtle, and a tuna. Now, you'll notice I didn't include a picture of a human, but you also have me here that you can look at. Or if you want to look in the mirror, you can take a look in the mirror because you obviously are a human. So here are the animals. Now, let's kind of take a look at the chart that talks about the different sets or characteristics. So this is similar to the chart that you have on your lab. Now, the first characteristic or set is the dorsal nerve cord. Now, I abbreviated this DNC, but it's the dorsal nerve cord. Guys, dorsal means the back. This means they have a nerve cord like your spinal cord that runs down their back. It also means they also have a notochord. Now, a notochord is a flexible type structure that supports the spine. It doesn't have to be bone in this case, but it does support the spine. The second characteristic is paired appendages. This means that they have a pair of arms, or a pair of legs, or a pair of fins. But it doesn't matter what appendage it is, there's at least two of them. 
Okay, here's the thing. Also, it has a mispaper for cubal column. This means they have an actual back bone. This one will be a little harder to see, but if they have paired appendages in this particular case, they also have a vertebral column. Step three looks at paired legs. So now we're getting more specific. We're not just saying they have paired fins or paired arms or paired wings. We're saying, hey, do they have legs in this case? Number four is an amnion. Guys, an amnion is a sac of fluid that surrounds a developing embryo. This allows it to be developed away from water. So it can be inside of an egg or it can be inside of an organism. But it allows them to be able to lay eggs or to have children or kids away from water. Okay. The next one's mammary glands. Mammary glands are glands that produce milk that are going to supply milk to their young. Okay, so we're going to see which animals have mammary glands versus which ones don't feed their babies with milk. The next one's the placenta. Is the placenta is a special organ that develops um, during pregnancy where the umbilical cord attaches to the placenta and it nourishes the baby inside the mother. Once the baby is born, however, then the mother has to give nourishment in a different way. Now, this means that they, they give birth to a kind of mature um, organism. Not necessarily saying that a human baby is mature once they're born, but they don't need to have oxygen supplied by the mother anymore, and they don't have to have the mother's body remove their urine or their waste. They can do that themselves. Okay? So when we look at this, this means that during development, they have to rely on the mother for some of that through the placenta. Now, this also means, though, guys, there's no eggs involved, like laying eggs, and there's no pouches. So that might help you decide whether or not they, some of these animals have a placenta or not. The next ones are canine teeth short. Because your canine teeth are the ones here that are your pointy teeth. Okay? They're your canines. Ours are short. They're not super long like you would see for a lion or a gorilla. Okay? They're shorter in their um, structure because they're different. We don't use them to tear meat as much as, as, as those organisms do. Okay? So they're shorter. Also, the other trait here is the foramen magnum forward. This means that the spinal cord opening into the skull is right underneath, meaning that they can stand straight up, okay? You can walk on two legs and you can stand straight up. A lot of organisms, it comes in at an angle and that's why they have to be hunched over. Even though they may walk on legs, they still have to use their arms for some movement, okay? So these are the traits we're going to be looking at. So let's pull these animals back up again. Okay, so here's our animals, so let's take a look at them. Now our first trait, of course, was the dorsal nerve cord and the notochord. This just means they have a spinal cord running across their back. Now I'm going to help you out with this. You could look it up online, but I'm going to help you out. And I'm going to tell you that all of them have this. So you're going to put an X through all of these animals. They each have a dorsal nerve cord and a notochord, which means this is the ancestral trait because they all have it. Okay? Now let's take a look at the paired appendages and the vertebral column. So I bring the animals back up. Obviously with the kangaroo, you can see that they have two arms, two legs. All right. The lamprey, however, if you look here, I didn't give you a full body picture, but it doesn't matter because they don't have it. They don't have any arms, they don't have any fins, they don't have any legs, they have no paired appendages. The monkey, you can obviously see that they do. The frog, the turtle, and the tuna as well, all have paired appendages. Now, this means that if they have paired appendages, they also have a backbone. The lamprey does not have a backbone either. So as we go through and mark our chart, we're going to put an X in all of the boxes except the lamprey. The lamprey is now done. The only characteristic it has is the dorsal nerve cord. So we're going to put a 1 down here in, the, uh, in, its, uh, in its column. So now, let's look at paired legs. Now, I've removed the lamprey from the pictures because you're not going to look at him anymore. He's done. So if we look here, kangaroo has paired legs. So does the monkey, so does the turtle, the bullfrog, but the tuna, they just have fins, so we can't put them down as having paired legs. So as we go through here, again, we'll put X's on every column except the tuna, and the tuna gets a two down at the bottom. So hopefully you're seeing how this is working. Now let's look at the amnion. So I pull everything up except for the tuna. Now the amnion, this means that they can lay eggs or have their offspring away from water. Can the kangaroo? Yes, they can. They live in the desert in Australia. They have to, they're going to be away from water. Monkeys, you know, they give live birth as well. Turtles lay eggs. But what about the bullfrogs? When bullfrogs lay eggs, they lay them near water because when they are born, they are tadpoles, which means they require water. So again, as we go through here, you're going to put an X in every column except the bullfrog. Now the bullfrog has three traits. Okay? Now go through the rest of these traits. If you need to look them up, by all means, do so. 
know. But let me give you a hint. Down here at the bottom, you are going to have numbers one through seven. There's not going to be any repeats. There's not going to be two number threes, two number fives, two number sixes. All you're going to see though is numbers one through seven located in the bottom, which means one of these organisms is going to have all seven traits. Once you've completed this chart, you can now create your cladogram. On your cladogram here, you can see in your, in your um, lab, there's a line already drawn. On this line, you're going to start placing the traits, because they have to be there as well, and the organism. Remember the first trait that all of the organisms has was the ancestral trait? Well, it goes first. It's going to go on the very bottom of this line. This is the dorsal nerve cord or the notochord. It's going to go there. Okay. Remember then, the only animal that had just that was the lamprey, so it's listed next. Okay, the animals are going to come off the line. The second trait is the paired appendages or, verte or vertebral column. Now, guys, if you notice here, the lamprey is behind it, which means it tells you the lamprey does not have these traits. Okay, everything above this point will have these traits. So then our next animal that only had two traits was the tuna. In the third case, you'll put your paired leg, which then we add the bullfrog. The next is the amnion. Because the bull, remember the bullfrog did not have it, and you're going to continue to put the traits and animals on your cladogram. I am not going to complete this for you. Now, guys, one thing to note with cladograms is they can be constructed using all kinds of data. In this case, we're using physical structures, but we could use DNA sequence, behavior, or again physiology to create a cladogram. All cladograms are going to be different based on what traits you're looking at and what organisms are involved. Now, when you complete your cladogram, you're not quite done. If you look on your um, uh, assignment, it tells you there's an application underneath the chart. The application says if you have found three previously unknown vertebrates, okay, they've been discovered in South America. One is iguana lizard-like. Another is like a large rat, and the third is like a goldfish. I want you to place these three new organisms on your cladogram. But after you do that, I also want you to tell me why you placed them where you did. That's super important. That tells me you kind of understand how this would work. So you need to place them on your cladogram, and then down at the bottom, you need to justify why. Tell me in a sentence or two why you placed them there. Once you're done with that, you now have the tools you need to get maximum points on this lab. If you have any questions as you're working on this, please feel free to um, send me a message to Canvas, and I will get back to you. Happy studies!